Today's series uh, is presented by Bricker and Eckler, represented by Jim Flynn and his associates, and Ohio Health, represented by Aaron Crooks and his associates. Uh, the forum is also sponsored by Cardinal Health, represented by Diane Radigan and her associates. Please join me in thanking our sponsors and welcome. Jim, it's your turn. Come on up to the stage. Along with uh, our friends at Ohio Health, Bricker Neckler is proud to be a sponsor of today's um, luncheon here at the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Uh, Bricker Neckler supports the Metropolitan Club uh, and has for years, as I know many of you have, and we're just so pleased to be uh, able to come here and learn about things the way we do, uh, and we will certainly today. So uh, information about the speakers today is actually in your forum flyer, so I'll just provide a, a very brief introduction. Uh, our first speaker is John Clark. John is the Vice President and Benefits Practice Leader for AssureX Global, a company founded in 1954 that currently offers more than 500 broker and independent agent offices around the world with more than $28 million in premium volume. Please welcome John Clark. <laughs> our next speaker is Jonathan Archie. Jonathan. Uh, is uh, vice president over the Ohio Hospital Association, and he helps keep hospital advocates apprised of the changing winds of healthcare policy and politics. As the director of government relations for the Ohio Hospital Association, I think that understates it a bit. I've seen Jonathan's act, and he combines entertainment and cutting edge information from Capitol Hill better than anybody I've seen. So please welcome Jonathan Archie. And finally, uh, serving as moderator and host is our next guest, Amy Rowling McGee. Since 2010, Amy has served as the president of the Health Policy Institute of Ohio, a nonpartisan, independent, nonprofit organization that provides information and analysis to state policymakers. Please welcome Amy Rowling McGee. So, again, I want to thank uh, all the speakers and the sponsors and all of you for attending today, and I will turn it over to Amy. Thank you. It's an honor to be here today, so thank you very much for the invitation. So one day last week, the Jimmy Kimmel Show took to the street interviewing regular people about which they liked best, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. <laughs> now the most telling part of the segment was that even in setting up the joke, Kimmel had to explain to his studio audience that the two were the same thing. Which brings us to why we're here today. Polls indicate that only about half of us understand the most significant parts of the Affordable Care Act and that misperceptions abound. I can admit that even as someone who spends nearly every day reading about and analyzing health policy, I continue to learn about the details of specific provisions or potential impacts that the law may have. So today we'll start with a broad overview of the law, focusing on those provisions that go into effect January 1st, 2014. Then we'll hear from my fellow panelists regarding how some of those provisions impact the sectors that they represent. So ref for, for reference, in the middle of your table, there is a handout with some slides. So you'll need to, to share. So, so to start, um, the ACA's coverage-related provisions will primarily impact the 14% of Ohioans who don't have insurance today and the 5% of Ohioans who currently obtain insurance through the individual market. For context, though, it's important to note that about 51% of Ohioans are currently covered through their employers. And we don't expect that to change much, at least in the, in the short term. So in terms of what was envisioned in the Affordable Care Act as it was originally enacted in terms of subsidized health coverage for Ohioans, you'll see that what was planned was an, an expansion of Medicaid coverage um, for all Ohioans up to 138% of the federal poverty level or at other levels based on what those are currently today. And then for those people um, not covered by Medicaid, from 138 up to 400, there would be tax credits to offset 
the cost of insurance. And just, just to, as a point of reference, 400% of the federal poverty level is 78,120 for a family of three. So if you were um, below 138% of the federal poverty level, you would be covered on, with Medicaid. And then if you were above, you would have access to tax credits. And then also, if you were on the lower end of that scale, you'd have access to cost-sharing subsidies to offset some of those additional um, costs of insurance or associated with getting services. Now, as it stands today, our General Assembly has decided not to move forward on an expansion of Medicaid coverage. This was not a state policy decision in the law as it was originally enacted. It became a state policy decision when the Supreme Court ruled at the end of last June that the federal government could not, in effect, coerce states into expanding Medicaid. So that then put a decision in front of our General Assembly um, for their consideration. And it is still under consideration. About half the states in the country have decided to move forward. There are a few states for whom the, the decision is still pending, and then others have decided not to move forward with the Medicaid expansion. And on, on the slide, you'll see it looks like it's not that many people, um, but analysis that we've conducted in conjunction with some other researchers shows that that lightly shaded area where there would be no coverage assistance um, would be about 370,000 by 2017. So it looks small um, when you look at it in this, in this scale, but it is a, a relatively large number of people. Now that's not to say that all of those 370,000 people would actually take up that coverage or take it up immediately, but those were the people who would be left in that, we sometimes refer to it as a donut hole. Um, so there would be, they couldn't get into the exchange and they would have no other option unless they happened to find a full-time job with, with benefits. Now in terms of where we're at in, in, um, in the implementation of the new insurance marketplaces, um, you've probably heard that October 1st was to be the launch of the federally facilitated marketplace. Here in Ohio, we decided not to run our own insurance marketplace. These were previously called exchanges, and now we've moved on to the, the term marketplace. Um, so, and you may have heard that there have been technological and other issues with the launch of the marketplaces that are being worked out um, today. Now, um, the, type, the kind of coverage that is going to be offered in the individual marketplace is different than the kind of coverage that's available today um, in, in the individual and small group markets. So only qualified health plans will be offered through, through the marketplaces. And these, mar these plans need to meet minimum standards of quality, value, and benefit design. There's also several significant insurance market reforms that go into effect January 1st. So today, insurers can rate based on your health conditions. They can um, deny coverage based on health conditions. And of course, the, the cost of coverage also um, is related to your pre-existing conditions. Only four factors can be considered in determining insurance rates going forward. And those are your, your age, whether you're a tobacco user, what part of the state you live in, and whether or not it's an individual or family plan. So those are the only things that can be considered in terms of um, making an offer of coverage or what the cost of that coverage will be. And there will be four categories of marketplace insurance plans, um, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. So what varies in those is the amount that you would pay in terms of premium, and then consequently the, um, the amount that the plan will pay for the actual cost of care going forward versus the amount that you will, you will need to pay. And also notably, plans will be required to cover essential health benefits, and there's a list of those in the handout. Um, probably the most significant on that list is, is maternity coverage, which um, typically today, if you're buying coverage in the individual market, you need to get a separate rider to cover maternity, and this will be 
just an, an inherent part of every plan that's offered going forward. We have 11 issuers in Ohio who will be offering coverage and countless plans associated with those issuers. And in the, the shop exchange, which is a separate marketplace for small businesses to purchase coverage, there will be six issuers. Now, I happen to know that in Franklin County, because that's the region where our small business, we're a, we're a small business, we have a budget of about 1.2 million and a staff of seven. So I um, have done a, a little bit more looking into the, the shop exchange, and I noticed we had two, two issuers and four, or maybe it was five, plans offered in the shop exchange in Franklin County. So theoretically, um, once the, the federal insurance marketplace is working, um, people will be able to go online to healthcare.gov. They will be able to look at the plans that are offered in, in their region, compare them based on the benefits, um, apply for tax credits if they're eligible or cost sharing subsidies if they're eligible, and then move forward with actually purchasing a plan. So with that introduction, I will move on to my panelists. So I'm going to start with John Clark. Given that over half of Ohioans get their coverage through their employer, how might they be impacted by the ACA, either directly or indirectly? Um, thank you uh, for uh, allowing me to participate today. The, uh, I was asked to talk about health care reform legislation, and uh, I was worried that we were going to go through all the legislation and components of it because I'm sure everyone has seen plenty of that. And uh, so I think the topics, and I think what Amy covered, is, is really current activities. I, I wanted, before I answer the questions, I, have, I, I love, I'm still old school, so I like to read the paper. I look at the computer enough. So I have a few clippings to share with this, and this is from the... Uh, Business First Columbus, it says, Obamacare is coming, so deal with it. I thought that was appropriate. And, and to, in the spirit of bipartisan, this was in the Cincinnati paper. And this is from uh, Senator Portman. Obamacare was doomed to fail. And uh, just one quote that, or he had it in the article here, it should be no surprise that we are discovering new problems with the law seemingly every day, as then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi famously said, we have to pass the bill so we can find out what's in it. <laughs> so again, in the spirit of, uh, this is uh, Sherrod Brown, um, who has been uninsured and waiting for the system, he's going to buy his health care coverage through the exchange which my guess is if that he tried to get on October 1st, like many of the other people, he wasn't able to get on because of, as Amy put it, the glitches. So a lot of activity uh, has taken place for, since the, the passage of the bill, um, you know, from a, uh, I come from the, a, an agent broker consultant's perspective, uh, understanding the impact of an employer who's purchasing health care but also uh, understand the impact that it's had on um, carriers and, and to a certain degree providers. It is, uh, the impact has been dramatic. A lot of, enormous amount of time, energy, and money has spent in order to get into compliance. Uh, and even there's been certain delays. And, and, and I guess specifically to answer the question, uh, there was a delay in the employer mandate. And I had asked before, I assume majority of the people, and I don't want to, make that assumption are working for an employer with 50 or more employees because there's a significant difference in the legislation if you are what they've defined as small group if you have less than 50 employees versus large group 50 over because originally part of the legislation there was a mandate uh, over 50 and they've delayed that implementation for a year but prior to that there was a lot of and again if if you are involved in the administration of your health plan at your employer, you were involved in a lot of discussion about tracking hours, about uh, pay or play analysis, uh, employer shared responsibility. Again, as Amy talked, people are very confused about this legislation, so we continue to add different terms, phrases, and acronyms on it. So those were some of the activities that were taking place 
up until a delay that was announced mid-summer. So I think from a large employer's perspective, people said, oh, I don't have to deal with it. Well, that's not necessarily the case because there is still some impact and some preparation and some options that you have to consider, uh, whether you're a small group or a large group. For, but for a larger employer, it's really a bit, it's more about strategy, about planning for the future, uh, about renewing early, possibly, to avoid some of the legislation. Uh, it's about trying to avoid, depending upon your size, uh, community rating. So a lot of employer groups may be renewing in December to avoid legislation that takes place January 1 to avoid that impact of community rating. Small group, and, and this could be where Amy works, people are looking at, do we continue to provide the coverage? Um, again, depending upon what surveys you believe, surveys two or three years ago said, all small employers are gonna drop coverage. Well, there are limited options if you are an employer and you're gonna say, I'm gonna drop coverage. Employees, you have to go in the exchange and buy. And I think probably even now with some of the concerns that there are from an employer perspective, they're probably not considering that as an option today. Um, I think, again, small employers, they're finding that it may be in their best interest if they can renew early, especially if they have a January 1 anniversary, renew 12-1, and again, buy some time to put off what some of these changes and impacts are gonna be. Uh, individual market, significant changes and impact. And again, a couple things that, um, changes that were made or changes in the legislation. Um, individual policies and small group policies were underwritten. So from a carrier's perspective, they could determine if they wanted to, on the individual policy, decline based off of health conditions. So that's why people were uninsured or they didn't wanna buy it. So there's an individual mandate um, and there's no underwriting and it's a guaranteed issue. So that's why the opportunity, and that's a great thing for individuals who have been denied for years, they have pre-existing conditions. So, you know, usually with politics, the truth is somewhere in between um, because it, it's, it's not, it's legislation that, and, and again, it's kind of embarrassing that it's been voted on probably numerous times to repeal the legislation. Uh, and so I like this article, deal with it, because that's what we have to do. Is it the best legislation? No, it, it, it does have some faults. Does it need some uh, adjustments and refinement? And they've done that already, some delays and some things. But uh, there are some good things uh, that are coming out of the legislation, uh, dependent age, some preventative services covered. Um, so it does, well, it, it's gonna impact everybody, certainly in this room, there are costs. Um, so if those people that have been uninsured, have been denied, and they're in the system, that's gonna have some impact, because I think there's some concern right now that if you're young, you're uninsured, and you didn't purchase before, uh, why would you purchase now? Because the penalty uh, is not that, uh, is they, when you look at the cost, I'd rather, some people are gonna say, I'll pay the penalty versus getting the coverage. And when that happens, and that will happen, you're gonna have people getting into the insurance pool with health conditions, and that young and invincible population is not gonna come into the system. Okay, great, thank you. And I just want to go back to the example I used of our, of our small group. We, you know, how this will impact small businesses really depends on the small business. Um, for us, we have a lot of kind of significant risk in our group. So when I looked at, when I compared what we're paying today versus what the rates look like in the, the shop exchange, it looks like they're going to go down. But if we were a group that had younger people um, without significant health conditions and um, women who were not of childbearing age, we might actually see rates go up. So it really kind of depends, and, the, and it's the same sort of example in the individual market. What, how this might impact you or someone you know really depends on their personal circumstances, their, their income, their health conditions. Um, so it's been, it's been very difficult. A lot of times when we've spoken with the media um, recently, they've wanted kind of clear-cut conclusions, and our 
uh, we've often said it, it depends. It depends on the individual or small group's circumstances. All right, so now I'd like to move on to, to Jonathan. Um, so how do the ACA coverage changes that result in more people either having public or private health insurance impact hospitals? Well, thanks, Amy, and uh, John, for your comments. Um, you know, hospitals definitely uh, are hopeful that the ACA's coverage provisions will increase coverage. Um, we, think that we think that they will, but uh, we're kind of along for the ride like everyone else. Um, we're all kind of experiencing this as, as a country, and, um, you know, hospitals are both providers of care and usually the largest, one of the largest employers in their community. So they're, they're approaching this from the perspective of not only uh, a provider of care, but also uh, as an employer. They have to wear both of those hats at the same time. In fact, six of the ten largest uh, companies that are headquartered in Ohio are hospitals or health systems. So it's, it's kind of a unique uh, dichotomy that hospitals have um, in regard to the ACA. But when hospitals look at the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare or whatever folks want to call it, and everyone has an opinion on it, you know, it's, it's either the best thing um, since uh, sliced bread or it's the end of Western civilization as we know it. There's no middle ground on the two. Um, I mean, there are a lot of opinions because it's a very passionate issue and it's a very personal issue. Healthcare always has been. Um, but when hospitals approach the Affordable Care Act and, and when they look at the impact of various provisions, they're not just looking at health reform in respect to the law that was passed in 2010. Health reform for providers, at least, and a lot of healthcare stakeholders, insurers and others as well, it, it really goes beyond just the ACA. Um, health reform has been going on uh, as a trend, as an evolutionary trend here in our country, policy-wise, uh, for quite a while. And uh, the latest iteration has really begun in the, in the 90s and is continuing now. The health reform law is certainly a big chapter in that. Um, it's something that's, that's uh, happening all at once, or at least it seems it's happening all at once. People talk about the rollout of the exchanges or marketplaces and, and the rollout of various insurance provisions, but those, even, those, even though those take place and take effect in 2014, hospitals and other providers have been dealing with the provisions of the ACA basically since it passed. It's been coming online uh, periodically with, with rules and other changes. Um, there are aspects of the Affordable Care Act that hospitals would like to see changed. I think there are, there are a lot of stakeholders that would like to see various elements changed of the ACA. There are also elements that, that we've em, uh, embraced for a long time before the ACA and, and think it's a long time in coming, uh, some of the insurance market reforms and some of the provisions aimed at in, encouraging coverage. Hospitals really have three priorities when it comes to, when it comes to that broader sense of health care reform. Um, we understand that the delivery system, the, the system in general, is not a single system, and it has to be reformed because it's, it's not sustainable in its current format, uh, economically, for, for the people who are on the receiving end of it. And so we, we look at it, um, three different pillars of, of health reform. Um, changing the delivery system, in other words, the way that the elements of the healthcare system work together. And we're working with, with physicians and other providers to, to provide more seamless care from the patient perspective. Also, the financing system that I mentioned, it's got to be more sustainable. Uh, right now, it's, it's just not sustainable. The healthcare costs are high. Uh, it's funny, though, healthcare costs are never that high when it's your loved one, right? Uh, <laughs> do whatever test is necessary, take care of my mom or dad. Um, but in, in the aggregate, we do understand that we, we spend a lot for healthcare in this country. And hospitals recognize that, that uh, they're a part of that and that getting a more efficient system is essential to making it more sustainable. But the third pillar is really the coverage and access, which is what we've been talking about uh, today. Um, and, and when it comes to coverage and access, you know, hospitals are, have, have uh, a few goals. They want to help people get coverage, um, and they want to help businesses provide that coverage for their employees when they can. Uh, and they also want to make sure that the, the care, the services that, that those folks need is available and they have access to it in, uh, in a reasonable time. Uh, and right now, the, the current system is not sustainable. So we're very hopeful that the, the coverage provisions actually do what they're intended to do. It's probably going to be a little bit bumpy along the way. Where there are going to be some step, setbacks. There always are in healthcare. Uh, there are always some two steps forward and one step back. But, but um, the, you know, with one in ten Ohioans lacking coverage right now, um, something has to be done. And, and you can't look at the rollout of the marketplaces without also looking at another key provision of the ACA. And that's, of course, the, the coverage expansions under Medicaid and, and the fact that, as you mentioned, Amy, that it's optional now for states to do that. The state of Ohio, the governor, the General Assembly, they're all grappling with it. The various stakeholders are behind it uh, and supportive of it, and, and hospitals continue to be. 
but when people don't have health insurance, it has a really strong effect on the healthcare system. It's part of why the healthcare system is unsustainable. And when, when you don't have access to healthcare, you tend to avoid seeking healthcare services. And when you do that, you let your conditions worsen uh, until they become so acute and so complicated that you have no choice but to go to the emergency department. And usually by that point, things have progressed so far that where they, whereas they could have been managed earlier on in a primary care setting, uh, it's much more difficult when it becomes chronic and acute. And, uh, and, and usually folks show up in an emergency department in the hospital, and that's, that's usually not the most efficient way to get primary care. So that's why hospitals support getting people coverage because that way they'll have access to the right care at the right time and the right setting earlier in their condition rather than when it becomes acute. Hospitals focus on the acute, and they're pretty good at that. Um, you know, we're, we're still kind of having this foray into the primary care world. Um, so that's why we're su supportive of the coverage uh, expansion, not only through the marketplaces, but in particular when it comes to uh, Medicaid eligibility. And uh, we think that the state of Ohio will eventually get there. Great. So, John, I know one of your areas of expertise are private exchanges. So could you talk a little bit about the difference between a private exchange versus the, the sure. public health marketplace? So uh, a couple weeks ago, Walgreens announced that they were moving all their employees, 120,000 employees, into a private exchange. And, and they're not the first company that has made that announcement. And you're going that will be a trend that will continue. So to Amy's question, what does a private exchange mean? And, and as indicated in the program and on my bio, uh, that I'm actually working uh, at AssureX Global with our partners, and we have 53 uh, U.S. shareholders and partners. In fact, uh, one of them actually is in Columbus, the Oswald Companies, insurance agencies, and building a private exchange for our partners to use for their employer groups. So what is a private exchange or a public exchange? And again, it's a online experience for insureds, members, consumers to enroll and purchase their health care. Uh, obviously, the difference in public and private is stated in its name. So the public exchange went live October 1st. Um, again, as Amy talked about, qualified plans have to meet those certain standard plans. Uh, essential benefits need to be required and covered. Uh, they can pick parts of the state they want to operate. I don't know if anybody's been to the site. Uh, evidently, somebody has been there since it's been shut down a couple times. But a lot of activity there, a lot of shoppers. So that coverage on the public exchange takes place January 1st. And there will be a lot of people, obviously, that will enroll because they need the coverage. They're finding it affordable. They've never been able to get coverage before. Uh, so access in the public exchange, again, expanding coverage. Uh, and the private exchange, um, and you'll, if there are different companies, uh, the Mercer, the Aons, the Surex Globals, Liaisons, building private exchanges. So it would be for their customers to use. Uh, and again, it's an employer group setting. Most of them are, again, in the large group market, either the 50 plus or 100 plus employees. And it's a packaged menu, if you will, of selection of medical plan options, uh, ancillary benefits, your life, your dental, vision, uh, disability, uh, could be packaged with a, a wellness component, a telemedicine, flexible benefits, health savings accounts, COBRA administration. So it's a prepackaged plan. And again, it's an online experience for consumers. So it has a kind of a consumer decision-making tool to help consumers find the best plan for themselves, kind of a shopping cart, if you will. Uh, but the key component is, is many times these ex private exchanges, uh, the approach is through a defined contribution. So as an employer, I make a decision that I'm going to uh, give each one of my employees X dollars to do the shopping. So if they have $2,000, they select which health plan they want to select. It's deducted from my defined contribution amount. So it's a menu of options. They see what it costs. They may have some left over. They may have some that they have to contribute and pay. But it puts back, the, you know, we've talked about consumers being health care. It's difficult, I think, in the environment of seeking services, whether you're at a physician or a hospital, really to be a consumer. You're going to get the care that you need. 
But this really makes you as a consumer at time of enrollment, what plans are best suited for myself and my family? Do I need those coverages? Do I need vision? I like that wellness feature. I want the best medical plan. I'm willing to enroll in a health savings account. So you get those selections through an online portal and through a marketplace or an exchange as it's referred to. Great. So, so Jonathan, some, some express concerns that because more people will be covered and more services are or will be covered, that there will be capacity challenges, meaning that there are not enough providers available to address the demand. So what, what are your thoughts about that concern? Well, I mean, the, the notion of uh, capacity issues and, and demand increasing in, in healthcare is really something that predates the ACA. It's nothing new. Um, just a look at demographics tells us that the population is aging, and as, as people get older, they typically require more healthcare services. Um, unfortunately, it's the way of life. And, um, and so demographics are really driving the demand in healthcare more so than any other piece of, any piece of legislation or any, any public policy will, uh, although they'll have an effect. And um, we have to be cognizant of that. We have to be, we, we are recognizing as a community of hospitals around the state and the nation that having adequate caregivers in the right place to give the, the right care at the right time uh, is gonna be a big deal and it, it, can, it has been uh, a big issue. Um, there are ways to address that and uh, part of that is getting more nurses into the, into the pipeline, more physicians into the pipeline, particularly in the rural parts of the state and the country. Um, telemedicine is another option that, that is uh, increasingly viable. You know, folks can access healthcare services from a major metropolitan area, um, perhaps a, an academic medical center, um, and, and, and be located in a, in a fairly rural uh, part of the, the state or part of the country. Uh, so those are, those are two ways of getting at it. Um, there are ways of getting at demand, but really what it comes down to is just providing care more efficiently. Um, it, you know, no one would argue that we're not spending enough in healthcare. Perhaps we're spending it in the wrong places, or some of the wrong places, or at least inefficiently. And we always have to remember that every dollar in healthcare is, it, you know, it might be considered waste to some, but it's, it's someone's dollar in that system. Um, so changing that is, is kind of complicated because a, a lot of stakes are at, uh, a lot of people have a, a stake in the outcome. Um, but I think you can address the demands uh, that demographics provide and, uh, and increased demand on health care um, mainly through a, a restructuring of the health care system that, again, goes beyond the ACA and, and is a larger concept of reform than just that particular law. Well, and I understand it's my host prerogative to also share some of my own thoughts on that topic, so I agree with um, everything that, that Jonathan just said. Um, but I, I would just also add that we, we've spent some time in our organization looking at the data related to this challenge, and one of the challenges is that there is not good data. Um, so that is something we need to overcome. Um, but just looking back historically, so the last time there was a major health policy change was when? This is a quiz, audience participation. The mid-1960s, um, when Medicaid and Medicare were first enacted. And if you look at per capita provider capacity prior to that, it was much lower than what it became a few years after that. So I think the market, in part, will adjust. It's not a perfect answer, because it'll take some time for the market to adjust. Um, but, but also, there were investments made at the same time in graduate medical ed education and making sure that there were sufficient supplies of people coming through the pipeline. And so we need to be attentive to that as well. So I have one, one last question, and then um, in Columbus Metropolitan, Columbus Metropolitan Club tradition, we will open it up for audience questions. Um, so, and you, you gave me a perfect segue, Jonathan, to this question. Um, but we know that the U.S. spends more on health care than many other countries, but with worse outcomes, and that Ohio spends more per person on health care than all but 17 states, yet 36 states have a healthier workforce. So obviously this is a complex issue, and you know, you have five minutes to address it. Um, <laughs> But what one change would you suggest to policymakers for consideration in addressing this problem? Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to butcher the quote, and I, and I cannot recall the person who said it, but um, uh, the gist of it is every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it's achieving. Um, 
and it's, it's true. If it, if it weren't designed that way, it wouldn't be achieving those results. It would be achieving different results. I would suggest to policymakers, and I have uh, in my role as uh, in government relations for the Ohio Hospital Association, working with members of our congressional delegation, um, you know, if you, if you want the system to change, you have to change the incentives within it. Uh, the incentives within it have to change, and, and, and once they do, uh, we, we see results. We're, we've seen that already, and the, the system is changing. It is adapting. That's what folks don't really always recognize. We think we have this monolithic structure that we're stuck with, and that's how it is, and that's how it's always going to be, when in fact it's always evolving. Um, if you align incentives, uh, and I, I think the, the governor's office on health transformation has, has taken great strides in this direction. Uh, a lot of other stakeholders independently, Ohio Health, other health care providers across the state, um, physician groups have taken the, st the, the steps necessary to, to coordinate care better and to, to align the incentives in a way that, that, that makes sense so that we're paying for value in the healthcare system rather than just more volume. Uh, I think we, we can get there. It's, you know, um, I've been around long enough in the business. I actually had hair at one time. <laughs> and it was when we were selling health maintenance organizations, HMOs. And, and again, people didn't like it because you had to pick a primary care physician. You had to get approval to go see a specialist. You had to pay more if you went to an urgent care or emergency room. Well, that system did control costs because it controlled the access. And we're going to come full circle, whether people like it or not. And there's going to be some controls because there needs to be some control in the access. And they're going to call it something different. They're going to call them ACOs. But it's that same model of an integrated healthcare delivery system that the hospitals and physicians are going to have the right incentives aligned to control costs. Because again, and I'll speak from personal experience, I can tell my wife, this is what you have to do on our health plan, and it doesn't happen. She's going to do what she wants to do. So majority of the people will do that. So we need to be told what to do. I know we don't like that, but that's the way we can control the costs. We're Americans. Yeah, I know. <laughs> So now I'm going to um, blatantly pander to Dr. Long, who I see out there um, in the audience, and um, just share one, one wrap-up uh, statistic. So um, research shows that about 60% of the causes of premature death could be impacted by prevention, but we only invest 5% of our national health expenditures in prevention and public health. So we are way out of alignment. 95% of our expenditures are in health care. Only 5% are focused on health before you need care. So until we right size that dynamic, we're going to continue to be in the system that's getting us the results that we're getting today. So, um, so now we're going to go to audience questions and just a few notes. Um, CMC films all of its forums for broadcast on Columbus TV, the Ohio Channel broadcast on WOSU, and viewing on YouTube through a link on CMC's website. If you have a question, please go to the microphone and introduce yourself, and we thank you for not making long editorial comments. <laughs> Why do I always feel like you're speaking to me when you say that? <laughs> Uh, my name is John McKnight. I work for Rife's Auto Body, which is a small family-owned business in Columbus, teetering right on 50 employees. So we're kind of right on the brink there. Um, my question has to do with something else, though. Um, I've heard several different people say that, uh, that that doctors, physicians are fleeing the industry right now because of, you know, whatever negative effects uh, the ACA is going to have on them as professionals. Um, and so my question is: Is that true? Uh, are they leaving, you know, is there a significant percentage of, of doctors or healthcare professionals leaving the industry because of some effect this is going to have on them as professionals? Um, and uh, if it is true, why? What's, what, what's the cause of that? Because I've not, I've not gotten a clean answer to that. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I'll start if that's okay. Amy, I can only tell you the people that I golf with my physician friends, so you better answer that <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a terrible golfer, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, um, that's, not, that's not been our experience, uh, at least from the hospital's pr perspective. Um, you know, it, the, the physicians, uh, it, it's a calling, let's face it. Um, I'm an EMT by training as well. Um, 
I work with a lot of nurses. Uh, we at the Hospital Association work a lot with a lot of nurses. For everyone, for every clinician in healthcare, it really is a calling, more so than anything else. Um, and I don't see that diminishing. In fact, the demand for, uh, for nurse education is, is higher than ever. And uh, the, the issue that we have on that front is there aren't enough nurse educators. Uh, we're trying to remedy that, but uh, not enough you know, experienced nurses to become nurse educators and train the next generation. So we're really seeing the opposite effect. You know, I would just add that there's certainly been a, a movement away from a independent practice group and more allegiance with hospitals or selling their practice to hospitals. And I think, that, again, the jury's still out on the outcome of that until the quality and cost and care is aligned right. So I think an independent physician is tired, is exhausted as seeing reimbursements go down. So I think that may be the, the noise in the marketplace. But I think if they get in an environment uh, with many of the organizations here, they're going to find a better quality of life. And hopefully, recruitment of physicians will continue. So I'm not aware of specific data to, to address that question. Um, I don't know that we're allowed to call lifelines or anything, but I do see Tim Maglione in there. Uh, raise your hand, Tim. So it, he may have specific data related to, to this issue. Um, but I guess you know this is, a, this is a major policy change. And as Jonathan has alluded to, there's, there's other um, issues kind of wrapped up in the Affordable Care Act or related to the Affordable Care Act. So it probably also depends on where a particular provider is in their career path. You know, are they, are they kind of, you know, nearing retirement, so dealing with all of these new payment changes and, you know, going through practice transformation to become a patient-centered medical home or implementing electronic health records. Um, you know, those, those might be less, um, or a person kind of nearing retirement may be less amenable to making those kind of changes than somebody earlier in their career. But in terms of um, specific data, I think Tim would be a good person to talk to. Oh, and Tim, do you want to say something? Sure, go ahead, say something. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Tim Maglione, I'm with the Ohio State Medical Association. We uh, represent physicians. Um, I think you're right, Amy, that some of the older physicians may be looking at all of the changes coming and trying to decide whether or not it's going to work for the next three or four years that they may have wanted to practice. And so that might be some of those that you, that you hear are retiring early. But we have more licensed physicians in Ohio today than we did last year and we did the year before, which is a good thing, but it's still not keeping pace with what we're going to need in terms of demand. We need to educate more physicians. We need to educate more nurses. Uh, and, and I also think what you said about uh, the practice arrangements changing. Being in solo practice is not that easy anymore and staying in independent practice is not that easy with all of the regulations, even pre-ACA, dealing with the multitude of payers dealing with uh, the government, dealing with all, you know, HIPAA and all of these things, it's really hard. And so you're seeing more physicians align with larger groups of physicians or aligning with uh, hospital systems. But uh, I think uh, we, we need to have, and we could probably have a whole other forum on this discussion about workforce within healthcare and what we're going to do to ensure that we have enough <coughs> adequate supply of nurses and doctors to take care of us. 10,000 people a day are entering Medicare, a day. And so uh, we, we need to recognize that and get the workforce going. But I, I hope that uh, with this discussion, maybe this can be another idea for another day. All right, next question. I'm John Lowe. Um, there's been a great deal of negative advertising and blogs, et cetera, uh, really trying to undercut the uh, Affordable Care Act and Obama in the process, included things like uh, the claims about death panels. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about those kinds of things or if there are other things, and to what extent this has contributed to this confusion about what the ACA really is. So I'll start off. I, right before I came over here, I happened to be looking at some polling data um, that Kaiser, a, a national firm, commissions. And on this issue of death panels, um, they found that 42% of the people that they polled thought that it was truly a component of the Affordable Care Act, that there were such things, 42%. So just so you know, there are not death panels in the Affordable Care Act. Um, so let's like dispel that right now. Um, and now I'll hand it off to <laughs> my <laughs> analysts. 
<laughs> well, I, you know, there are, everybody's going to have their opinion. And um, it, as Amy said, if, if you are a small employer and you are have healthy employees and they're young, and you've got a, a very attractive rate from your carrier, when you move to the what some people would say the unaffordable health care act, uh, you're going to be impacted to this community rating, and you're not going to have a favorable experience of it. But again, if you're someone who's been uninsured or maybe a small employer that has high risk conditions and you've received the maximum allowable rate and you move into community rating and your rating is decreased, you're going to have a, a great experience on it. So there will continue to be opinions and counter opinions on the legislation for as long as it's still there because there will be just different perspectives on it. Uh, I'll just say that, um, you know, Politics and policy are two different things. And um, politics are, are often about emotion, um, more often than not. And um, you, know, you can disagree legitimately on aspects of policy, but healthcare in particular, because it's so personal to everyone, really evokes a lot of emotion in a lot of folks. Um, aside from it being a, a, a useful political tool, whichever side you're, you're on of an issue, um, it's, uh, you know, I, I always make the comparison that, um, you know, we're, it's also interesting, right? I mean, it's kind of fun to watch debate and argument and, and hear people on TV who seem to reflect our, our point of view on things. Um, I always make the comparison to the show John and Kate Plus Eight. How many folks are familiar with that? <laughs> uh, it was on a while back. It was about this couple who had octuplets. They already had a, a pair of twins. And they fought all the time. Um, I was familiar with it because my wife likes the show, uh, or liked it. <laughs> Um, but they, they fought all the time, John and Kate, and that was what was interesting, right? That's what made it an interesting show. That's what makes politics interesting. When people disagree, when they call each other names, when they, when they act sophomoric, even though they have the best intentions, um, it often, it often uh, devolves into that. Um, I will observe, however, that when John and Kate got divorced and they started talking civilly to one another, the ratings went to, you know, <laughs> into the trash can. It was awful. Um, so, I mean, a, a lot of this is, is just politics as usual, but a lot of it is also because it's just so personal to all of us. We all need health care, and so that's what, I, I'm not offering any observation on how to get past it, but this, we have to, as you said, deal with it. Well, and since the, the Health Policy Institute of Ohio is focused on providing independent and unbiased information and analysis, I've been very, very encouraged over the last several weeks related to a lot of the, the print media in our state putting out, I think, some really good solid pieces, um, fa fact-based pieces related to the Affordable Care Act, um, because I think that they've truly seen this as kind of an issue, I mean, a, a problem, meaning that there is so much misinformation, so much information that's kind of skewed to either side, and they've really been playing a key, key role um, in, in informing people about what the law really says. Hi, I'm Carol McGuire. I'm on the CMC board. I'd like to thank all three of you for being here today and for sharing um, the information that you have with us. It's, it's very valuable, obviously, for some, uh, uh, for, from this very timely uh, topic. Um, I like to consider myself a pretty uh, well-informed healthcare consumer. Um, and yet, one of the greatest frustrations I think many of us have is just understanding what something costs. Um, we can find things like MRIs that may vary tens of thousands of dollars from one place to another. In fact, quite frankly, I say to my vet who uh, treats my dog, uh, I can get more information there about what the costs are going to be than I can from any of my um, health care providers. So will we be um, looking at any possibility of better transparency or more transparency so those of us as consumers can shop and do so comparatively with costs and do our part to try to hold down the cost of health care? Well, I'll, I'll start. I, I think that, that we will see greater transparency, but what we also need to see are, are consumers or patients being more engaged in their care. I mean, I find there is something that happens to me when I'm on that exam room table where like every bit of intelligence I just whoop, goes right outside and I don't even ask questions. If they say I need this particular vaccine, I get that vaccine. If they say I need this test, I get this test. And I don't really ask questions about well, how much is that? 
is there a better place for me to go for that? Where can I get more information about that? There's just something that happens when you're sitting there and we, we all, because you could have all, all kinds of great transparency tools, but if no one is utilizing them, then they're not going to do anything to, to change that dynamic. Admit, Amy, I ask, and they don't know, or they'll say, well, and that's, well you're with this insurance right. company, we don't have any idea, uh, well, okay, how do I find out? I mean, the idea of being able to find out what something costs is so basic mm -hmm. to, to being able uh, to be a smart consumer, and yet there just doesn't seem to be anywhere to go find that information, because they can't even tell you there. Right. Would you, would you like to say it, it is a frustration, and, mm -hmm. and I share it with you as well. Uh, on a personal level, um, having family members and myself who have gone through various aspects of the healthcare system, um, one of the things that the American Hospital Association and other uh, groups around the country, at least w in regard to providers, are doing uh, is a project called the Patient Friendly Billing Project, uh, and it's, it's designed to help make it more transparent and make, help folks understand what exactly is involved. Uh, in, in the costs that, uh, that, are, that are incurred for their care. Um, uh, part of the confusion, part of the frustration, comes from the fact that we don't have a single health care system. Uh, if you go to the emergency department, you might be billed by the radiologist who doesn't work for the hospital, works as an independent actor, uh, an ind independent contractor, as it were, uh, and you might get billed by everyone else who's independently involved, even though for you it was a single episode of care. Um, that adds to the confusion, too. And so the Patient fin Friendly Billing Project and other aspects of uh, initiatives that are going on independently at hospital systems across the, the state uh, are, are trying to address that. Um, but getting around your arms around the health care system and, and uh, cost in general is a challenge for even the, the folks who are directly involved in it. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, my name's David Mellenthal. I'm just an old marketing guy. Um, but I have a question that I, about the future. I tend to look at trends. I like to look at them. Uh, you've already pointed out that doctors and hospitals are all going to be owned by the hospitals. And, uh, and, I think, and I think that that's a reality. I think Tim taught me that over 60% of the doctors in Ohio will be either in groups or employed by, by hospitals, which is very interesting. But what's more interesting, I was questioning, is that if you look on the exchange, you see that the less expensive options uh, the health care companies have made arrangements with only one hospital system and in competition with another. So my question is, are we going to a day when the hospitals, the health care companies, the doctors are all like this and they all compete against hospitals, doctors, and health insurance companies as if they were in competition? And are hospitals going to go directly and write this coverage? with healthcare uh, professionals only being administrators. I mean, it seems to me the whole system will run against another system in competition. I would be curious about that and what you think the impact of that is. You may not have time to answer it. <laughs> no, no, you, you know, it, it. And, uh, that's the narrow network or the ACOs. And uh, I think that's certainly in the, the public exchange in order to have costs that are affordable on the public exchange, that's certainly a direction. You'll certainly probably see that in the open market as well. Um, I think uh, from, I'm not going to speak for the hospitals, but probably the last thing they want to do is to get into the actual distribution of it. They want to be the provider of it. Um, but I think, again, from the carer's perspective, if they're asking, being asked to participate in exchanges, whether it's individual or small group market, because it's the right thing to do in the state and in the community, how can I get the best, mo the most affordable care? It's partnering up with, again, a distribution healthcare provider, hospital system, and their physician network. So I think you, that is the future you're going to continue to, to see. Well, and just one closing comment related to that with a more consumer focus is I mentioned earlier that there are four different kinds of plans that will be offered through the marketplace, bronze, silver, gold, et cetera. And one of my concerns is that people will, will look at just the premium cost and they'll leap towards the one that has the lowest premium cost without considering things like provider network or whether specific medications or services that you need um, are covered. And so it's very important for people to attend to those details, especially if you have health conditions. And, and this is where it would be helpful to have 
an agent or broker or a navigator or a certified application counselor assisting you with kind of figuring this out. And we didn't really have much of a, a chance to talk about all of those um, types of folks. But there will, there will be or are people out there who are available to assist people in kind of um, going through all of those details. Make sure you make reservations for the next forum. Uh, and I want to thank Ohio Health, Bricker and Eckler, and Cardinal Health again for uh, their sponsorship. And also, please thank our speakers, John Clark, Jonathan Archer, and Amy Rowling McGee. Thank you very much.